five. Spending all this time and effort re-engineering the Union Jack. But there's nothing important going on. It's not like the NHS needs any attention. Four. They could actually report a conversation to the police that was had in my own home. And that is chilling. Three. People asked me what it was like in the 70s. I said, I had a fantastic time. We also faced a lot of racism. Two. The lawmakers who have passed these laws, how many people do they think agree with them? One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Scotland's new Hate Crime and Public Order Act criminalises any speech which could be construed as stirring up hatred. It introduces offences for threatening or abusive behaviour, which previously only applied to race, but is now extended to protected characteristics including age, disability, sexual orientation and identity. More than 400 third-party reporting centres for hate crime have been set up across Scotland, Alison, where snitches can dob in fellow citizens (laughs) for alleged offences against liberal groupthink. What the hell is happening? J.K. Rowling responded to this new SMP law by tweeting a series of, quotes, offensive tweets, i.e. not very offensive, challenging police in front of her 14 million followers to arrest her when she returns to Scotland, the country she pointedly refers to as the home of the Enlightenment. The Harry Potter author, cheered on by millions, has effectively made an ass of the new law. Full marks, Gryffindor. Dissatisfaction with the NHS, meanwhile, has more than doubled in just two years, from 25% in 2020 to 51% in 2022. That's what we reported last week. Up to 9 million people are now on NHS waiting lists. But we've now learnt that over 250 NHS patients are dying needlessly each week because of the length of waits in A&E. That's according to calculations by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. The RCEM found that 65% of people were left in A&E for 12 hours or more were waiting for a bed, equating to more than 1 million patients a year. A&E delays caused around 14,000 excess deaths during 2023, says the RCEM. The direct correlation between delays and mortality rates is clear, said RCEM President Dr. Adrian Boyle. Excessively long waits continue to put patients at risk of serious harm. We've got a fabulous returning Planet Normal guest, Alison, as we welcome back educationalist and black community leader Tony Sewell, who has taken a lot of stick for pointing to significant improvements, yes, improvements, in UK race relations. There are signs too that inflation and the cost of living crisis may soon be easing. But before we get going, let's talk about Flag's co-pilot. A little playful update to the Union Jack ahead of this summer's Paris Olympics attempts to alter, refresh, enhance the nation's red, white and blue. That's got on your nerves, hasn't it? Oh dear, oh dear. (laughs) (laughs) Why can't they just leave it alone? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, listeners may have read this story or seen the truly abominable update of the Union flag or Union Jack, as some of us call it incorrectly. Yeah, some design agency, you know, paid millions of pounds to do rebranding of things that were perfectly good in the first place, has been given the British Olympic Association, commissioned them to enhance the team GB brand and the Union Jack that they came up with. Maybe we should put it in the show notes or maybe not because it might make people feel ill. It looks like a sort of twee Cass Kidston pattern as though Cass Kidston had spent a month in an opium den. (laughs) Oh, it's sort of psychedelic nonsense. And it's what the deluded designers call a desire to push the iconic red, white and blue as far as we could or basically do away with them. Because why would you want to have one of the most iconic national emblems? on the planet. Anyway, yes, really, really horrible, huge backlash, of course. And this is what they're selling, Liam. And they seem to think that the young of Britain can only be made to enjoy the Olympics by completely trashing our national symbols. What did you make of it? Even the phrase Team GB winds me up. Oh, me too. Why? Because there's Northern Ireland, which isn't part of GB. Mm. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, and Northern, Northern Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. So if you live in Northern Ireland, and a lot of people who are proudly British do live in Northern Ireland, then the phrase Team GB completely excludes you. And it's no wonder some people in Northern Ireland have got a bit upset about that. 
But then to go beyond that and to try and recreate, as you say, one of the most iconoclastic, one of the most widely recognized and most distinctive flags on earth, to think you, you need to change the colors to update it, however playfully, it's just crazy. As if there aren't other things that we need to worry about rather than updating the union flag. I think the reason it got under my skin really was because it's all part of this sort of quiet loathing of our own country, isn't it? So this agency, which is based in Bath, of course it would be called This Away, this is part of the thing they wrote, Liam. They said, elite sport by its very nature can be elitist. Well, who knew that? That's why they get the big bucks. That's why they get the big bucks, Alison. Can you imagine <laughs> you having such a rapier-like insight? <laughs> Elite sport can be elitist. By its very nature. And basically what they're saying is that Team GB doesn't need to be elitist because all those absolutely astonishing people like Dinah Asher Smith and who are, even as we speak, training round the clock for the Olympics, which is the absolute peak summit of world sport. Oh, no, it's basically all to do with people slobbing around on the sofa. So, yeah, I mean can't dislike it more really. And I think it's such a shame because Fatima Whitbread, who was of course our very distinguished Olympian javelin thrower, she said, I'm absolutely disgusted to think they've done it. Let's face it, it represents our late queen. It represents everything that embraces what's good about our country as years have gone by. No way should they have gone ahead and changed the country's symbolic colours. It's about national pride and unity. And I thought that was unimprovable what she said. And meanwhile, we're spending all this time and effort re-engineering the Union Jack, but there's nothing important going on. It's not like the NHS needs any attention. <laughs> and we're going to think about JK Rowling before we plough into the disaster that's the NHS. It's just a sea of woe in every direction, <laughs> isn't it? Okay, let's prophesize ourselves with the JK Rowling story then before we beat ourselves over the head with the NHS story. This was absolutely crazy. And I think J.K. Rowling, everyone knows what a bright cookie mm. she is, but she so brilliantly pricked the pomposity of this ridiculous new SMP law for my money. Yeah, she absolutely does. I know I shouldn't, Liam, but I just I haven't laughed so much in years. <laughs> I think it's because <laughs> as well as being sinister, it's just completely ridiculous and hilarious. Now, are you ready for this co-pilot? Let, let me read you part of the law, okay? A hate incident, which is not hate, not hyphen hate, can be recorded as a non-hate incident under hate legislation. <laughs> what does it mean? Tell us what it means. Make it stop. Yeah, as I said, I mean, I've just been absolutely laughing. And I think that the peak absurdity of this, I mean, we'll get down into the nitty gritty of, of what happened, that the Indian Council of Scotland, God bless them, reported Police Scotland to police Scotland for a hate crime because of actually absolutely extraordinarily, and this is something I know that you'd be interested in, is that the police had got in their sort of briefing notes that this hate monster, they've got like the sort of, you remember the Sugar Puffs monster, the SNP campaign, advertising campaign for the hate law features this hate monster. In the police guidance, it says the hate monster is most likely to lurk in young men with deep-rooted feelings of being socially and economically disadvantaged, combined with ideas about white male entitlement. Hate monster. It's like they're treating adults like we're all members of the Tufty Club and they're trying to <laughs> teach us how to cross the road with the it's exactly like Green that. Cross Code Man. I mean, the hate monster. Not only the hate monster, but basically the police indicating who they think are most likely to be the offenders, which is white working class lads. And that's what the great Indian Council of Scotland has reported at Scotland Police to Police Scotland. You can always rely on the Indian Council of Scotland. Good on them. Talk about sensible, pragmatic. Fantastic. But can you imagine that you can see then, I think, in that description exactly what's going on here. This isn't about a criminal justice system that's fair. This is about repression of certain attitudes and thoughts, which are sort of bien pensant, liberal government. And by the way, Liam, it was not just the SNP voted for this completely draconian legislation. It was most Labour, members of the Scottish Parliament, Greens and Liberal Democrats who used to be 
for liberalism, they voted for this as well. The conservatives, Scottish conservatives, did not vote for it. And it is totalitarian. If you read what it says, it is basically, even if you and I were in my kitchen, you know, having a cup of tea at the kitchen table, if someone was there, you know, one of our indignant teenagers who think I belong in the dark ages, they could actually report a conversation to the police that was had in my own home. And that is chilling. And it's going to happen, of course. It's going to happen not just in the home. It's going to happen at workplaces. This is going to be used for endless settling of scores. Yeah. I think the amount of executive headspace, time, resources will be used up with this absolute nonsense. It is a working definition of hoist by their own petard because the people who were for the act, the Hate and Public Order Act, said, oh no, there's no way that malcontents are going to weaponize this act for their own purposes. And in the first 48 hours since the act came into force, they've had more than 4,000 complaints have been made to the police. But, but get this, Liam, <laughs> more complaints were made about First Minister Hamza Youssef's 22 speech, which if Planet Normal listeners haven't seen this outrageous speech, this is Hamza Youssef when he was the Justice Minister of Scotland, standing up in the Scottish party and complaining that so many senior positions in Scottish life were held by white people. And that's Scotland, 95.4% white people. And it absolutely drips with dislike and condescension for white people. So that speech has been more complained about than J.K. Rowling. And as we said, Liam, I mean, Rowling has been an absolutely amazing, bold campaigner for women amidst all this trans hysteria. And she has, of course, opposed allowing men who say they identify as women into women's changing rooms and domestic violence refuges and all the places that women don't want men to go. But what she did, Liam, was she did this rather brilliant masterstroke. She posted on her Twitter account, as you said, 14 million followers. She posted a series of so-called offensive tweets, which were basically pointing out that certain women were actually men. And then she said, essentially what she said was, if you're big enough and hard enough, come and get me. And that was a direct message to Police Scotland saying, yeah, I'll be back in Scotland soon, the home of the Enlightenment, ha ha, and you can arrest me, come and arrest me. And they didn't have the balls to do it, did they? So the issue now, two issues, is JK Rowling actually, will she be registered as having a, a non-crime hate crime? on her record. And she posted rather beautifully, actually, she basically posted that she really hoped that police saying she wouldn't be arrested. She hoped that that would now going forward, afford protection to all the other women who, you know, were less able to defend themselves. I can't think offhand of anybody that wealthy and powerful using their wealth and power so brilliantly to defend millions of other people. It's certainly a very eye-catching move on her part. And I'd say she has the support of the silent majority of pretty much the entire country. I mean, the, the lawmakers who have passed these laws, how many people do they think agree with them? What share of the population do they think is backing this stuff? This reminds me very much of what happened in Ireland recently when the, the Bien Ponson of Ireland came up with two referendas wanting to quotes, update, refresh, modernize, playfully introduce new ideas into the Irish constitution. Yes. And guess what? It turns out that the Irish people are relatively small C conservative. They quite like the idea of the nuclear family. They quite like the idea of the sanctity of home life. But of course, you can like all those things, but still very much want women to take their place in the workforce and have fulfilled professional lives, you know, wh whatever they want to do. And yet the Irish intelligentsia, political and media class completely misjudged that one. And I'd say the Scottish media class is completely misjudging the introduction of this new rule, which is now a source of embarrassment, I'd say, for an awful lot of people. Mm. And JK Rowling has done an awful lot to lampoon this new law just as it comes in. And it just undermines the whole idea of lawmaking. It's a completely regressive development, in my view. 
something that really stands out for me is uh, no word so far on this shambles from Keir Starmer or Labour. And I think there's a, a very real concern that Labour would plan to introduce something very similar after its forthcoming landslide victory. And I agree with you, Liam. I don't think there's actually much popular support for this kind of thing. I think most people are absolutely bewildered by it and don't understand why a rapist can suddenly claim that they're a female and, and go to a, a women's prison. Who can forget the pink lycra leggings? Public backlash about that real outrage that this this horrible man in a blonde wig was going to sit, thought he could go to a women's prison. And there there are instances, Liam, sadly, of men being sent to women's prisons claiming that they are trans and then causing all sorts of fear and harm to women who in women's prisons, some of the most vulnerable women in the country. That's all you need, isn't it, when you're serving a long sentence is having some abusive bloke turning up. And I think that there's a very real possibility that Labour will try and do something because socialism is all about this kind of mind control. This has reminded a lot of people of East Germany and the Stasi, where you know you couldn't express your own thoughts in front of your own children. That's how chilling it was. And something else, Liam, that was also included in the protected characteristic was religion. Now, this is a really hot topic because we've had a lot of issues, haven't we, arising in Rochdale and elsewhere. We've got the Batley Grammar School teacher in hiding after Islamist mobs terrorised him and his family for showing a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad during, ironically, a class on blasphemy. And for me, this legislation that the trans stuff is a little bit of a sideshow, the misgendering, the pronouns. I think we're looking at a blasphemy law by the back door. And we do not want a blasphemy law in this country. We do not want religion having a sacred no-go status where we can't point out some very significant deterioration in our country, which could be brought about by people. And then you cannot have people saying you're Islamophobic because you've said X or Y. That's my concern about this act. And we use the word Orwellian, don't we? We yeah. bandy it about, but this is properly Orwellian. You know, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. I mean, this is really what they're saying is you will be, you know, potentially arrested if you don't agree that this man is a woman. It'd be very hard to explain to people of a previous generation, wouldn't it? It certainly would. And it's very hard to explain now to the general public why there is so much attention on this, why lawmakers are spending so much time you know, trying to solve a problem that barely exists, a problem that can be solved with regular human behavior and understanding. And meanwhile, quite astonishing figures. They were reported by our science editor, Sarah Napton, on Monday in The Telegraph. We'll put the link to that article in the show notes to this episode. But 250 needless deaths a week within the NHS. This isn't some you know, random study. This is calculation by the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And you don't get the feeling that this is just the regular cry for additional resources as the government seeks to allocate money. You get the sense here that something a lot deeper is going on. 250 patients a week are thought to have died needlessly because of lengthy waits in A&E. And it's not as if of RCEM are saying, it's about money. They're saying it's about organization. They're saying it's about how the NHS is run as opposed to the resources available for the NHS. I can't overstate how bad a state I think the NHS is in. I don't think we have a first world health service anymore. And I think that that has been hidden. I think the NHS is completely, well, not just in denial, but it's very publicly on the front foot, a PR campaign to say, yes, we're a bit under a bit of strain, but we've had a lot of patients coming through, catching up after the pandemic. No, Liam, it's absolutely dire, right? People are dying now because they can't get an appointment. It's not normal to have a developed country 
where it could take you a month to have a telephone appointment with a GP. And as you said at the top, the satisfaction with the NHS is at an all-time high. And I am really encouraged by these figures because they reflect such despair and dismay with our health service. I mean, you've actually got really over 70% of respondents to the British Social Attitude Survey are dismayed at the long waiting times for GP and hospital appointments. And I decided that one of our old favourites on Planet Normal, who helped us so much during COVID and the lockdown, is a senior source within NHS England, known to Planet Normal listeners as George. So I actually got in touch with George and I said, what was George's view how were these terrible surveys and studies and reports and things being received within the higher echelons of the NHS? And and, and this is what George said, Liam, there doesn't seem to be even any acknowledgement of either the satisfaction survey or the recent headlines on A&E waiting times killing people. Working at NHS England, says George, is like being on the International Space Station You wouldn't think there was much connection with the actual world of treating actual patients in actual hospitals. Those of us who have worked in frontline organisations are very few and far between. The executive group here are mostly anonymous, lots of people interim or doubling up on jobs. The current NHS restructure has been going on for around 18 months. They give us plenty of useless briefings, but never address any of the negative headlines about the NHS. The Department of Health and the NHS have always been left-leaning, says George. The received narrative, listen to this, Liam, the received narrative right now is that the strikes will go on until there's an election, thus driving a coach and horses through the idea that it is all financially motivated. It's clearly political. That's our taxes, Liam, a National Health Service which cannot offer appointments to very sick people. The NHS is a rogue socialist state. This week, we welcome back to Planet Normal educationalist Lord Tony Sewell. Born in Brixton, South London at the end of the 50s, part of a proud church-going Jamaican family, Tony Sewell's emerged as one of the UK's leading voices in the field of racial and social justice. Having previously worked as a journalist, a teacher and community leader, Sewell gained his doctorate in the mid-1990s and worked for several years as a university lecturer. In July 2020, he was appointed chair of the official Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, a government inquiry which concluded that while racism exists in the UK, the UK is not institutionally racist. The Sewell report caused a backlash from parts of the left, with one Cambridge academic comparing Tony Sewell to Joseph Goebbels and a black Labour MP responding by posting images of the Ku Klux Klan. Undaunted, Sewell has just published his new book, Black Success, The Surprising Truth, part memoir, part polemic, Sewell traces the hard-won achievements of the UK's black community back to what he sees as their true sources – family, religion, education, hard work, discipline and home ownership. Sewell argues in favour of rejecting victimhood and low expectations and embracing high ambitions. Tony Sewell, welcome back to Planet Normal. Great to have you returning to the programme. Great to be here. You really shot to public prominence, I think, when you were part of the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. You were the chair of that commission. Your commissioners came up with a report that said, while racism still exists, Britain as a whole is not a racist country. Just remind us of how that report was initially received. I think what happened was that it was it was almost it was happening with prior to the report, really. But there were lobby groups and activist groups that looked at the personnel that were on the committee and the commission and myself. And of course, they just wanted us to say something that, you know, without any kind of rigor or, or investigation that just condemned every single facet of the society as institutionally racist. 
and that was it. But we decided not to do that. We decided just to simply be honest and open and follow the numbers and the data and come up with the conclusions that, you know, that route took us. And I think what really happened there was you had the outcome of activist groups really beginning to try and control the narrative and the agenda. But worse still, they captured the media and people felt they had to come in and, and support it. The other thing was everybody was seemed to be, or everybody, a large chunk of our liberal society seemed to be drunk on the George Floyd kind of outcome, taking that elixir and then kind of feeling that in some kind of guilt run, they had to sort of support anything that was in a seemingly kind of anti-racist. And so in a sense, and on top of that, we'd just come out of COVID or we were just emerging from that. So it was that mixture, perfect storm or unperfect storm that we faced. It's almost two years ago that your commission reported, Tony. And in those two years, you've written a new book in your own right, Black Success, The Surprising Truth. The strength of language in your personal book, Tony, seems even stronger than in the report on race and ethnic disparities. What do you think's happened with race relations in the UK over the last two years since your report? Well, I think what's happened is that really the, the problem that they've, ha- they've got is that this is where my book and the report kind of bit different in the sense that I gave it over to the government and really championed by Kemi Badenoch. What she's done is extended the recommendations. You've got to remember the report wasn't just an analysis. It had lots and lots of recommendations based on analysis that really there were structural issues. So we weren't, we weren't running away from that. What I think has happened since is that those recommendations have been all implemented. One of the ones that I kind of think is very significant is the Office for Health Disparity. New stories move on, things like that. So I don't think people are upset with the report anymore, but we still have the kind of politics of identity. We still have a whole kind of seizure. The church is another example of people still feeling that the issue to do with race isn't as complex as we brought out in the report. They're not really thinking through the difference between disparity and discrimination. And that's the key problem that we've, that we've got to unravel here. There's a difference between the two things. Indeed. Take us back to the 70s and 80s. You grew up in South London. You were from a proud Jamaican background. The church was very important to you, as was reggae music very, very important to you. And then the Brixton riots happened in the early 80s and really exploded into your consciousness. How is the Britain, the the South London of 1981 that provoked those riots different to South London today? Well, let me just tell you one thing on the black demographic that's different. It's no longer Caribbean. It is essentially a West African space now, in a sense, or a Nigerian space. So if you go to any primary school now in London or, you know, that, that, that has, you know, a lot of black children in there, the majority of them will be of a Nigerian background. Now, that's significant in the sense that what we faced from the Caribbean context was, a, was different than I think what young people are facing now. And, and particularly, we, we were facing very open racism. A kind of, but, but it was in that whole thing that, that everybody seemed to be excluded, but black kids were excluded almost 10 times more. And then, of course, the issue with the police, the open racism with the police that exploded into those riots was significant. And so I grew up in that context. However, what was not being told, and that's where really the book is quite interesting, is that there was a significant amount of what I call agency and, and self-affirmation inside the suffering. People ask me what it was like in the 70s. I said, I had a fantastic time. On, on the other hand, I also, we also faced a lot of racism. So it's a dual thing that we face. You say in your book, we did, you say in the book, Tony, if I may, on a family show, we did get shat on. <laughs> but we were smart enough to use it as fertiliser for the imagination. I mean, that's, that's the Jamaican way, in a sense, or the Caribbean way. Let's get clear. It makes make wider here. And I think that ability to reinvent yourself. Let me give you an example of how that works itself in the housing context, where, for example, you know, the, the, the slogans, no blacks, no, no Irish, no dogs, that kind of open racism. So what that did, that forced that community to go and get their own houses themselves. 
And so what you then ended up with was a community of homeowners, and it's the biggest one even to today, to date. And so we were almost accumulating capital via the suffering. So we always had this kind of complex relationship with, I think, oppression in inverted commas. And I think that's what the book wants to try and do. It's not justifying it, but it's saying that, look, this, the situation, it, once we engage anything and we use our agency and our self-affirmation, we come out with something completely different. And, and it's a positive outcome. And that story hasn't been told. So the Winrush gets, gets kind of hijacked by the scandal in a way. And we don't really learn of the stories of, of resilience and of, uh, and of great things that that generation had accomplished. What you've got to understand, Liam, is that there's almost a vested interest in not going down the positive experience of black people in Britain. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to talk about the fact that that community suffered but yet did well. It's a kind of dualism that's there, but it's a reality. And I think that because, you see, if you, if you, if you lean on the side of anything to do with a positive outcome, the claim is either you're denying racism or you're colluding with it or you're somehow, you know, in some kind of, you know, delusion. And I think that's the problem that we face. And so what's exciting about the new generation, the Nigerians, come, is they haven't got that baggage at all. They've come straight in. And here's the irony. I don't know if you know, you know you're London, but the Nigerian community have, 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 have set stall in areas in the Caribbean community we wouldn't think of. For example, Thames Mead. All these, these areas have gone in and have just seen house prices and they, they set up stall and they're doing extremely well, particularly in education. And that shows you again that the almost dragon net, if you like, of a racist discourse that constantly will say so racial discourse on this because sometimes what happens is it doesn't allow you then to see another way through that the society has changed, has been more open, and you've got to almost be flexible with that. Otherwise, you're just in a corner, misery and moaning and really almost going backward. Another difference with your commission report of 2022, Tony, if I may say so, and your new book, Black Success, is that in your book, you don't have to use official committee speak. You can really use your own voice. And you really point the finger here. You say, it's clear to me that emerging alongside a genuine struggle for racial justice were race hustlers, your phrase. They needed and still need a narrative of victimhood in order to keep their jobs, receive grants, stay relevant. Sadly, this hasn't changed. There are new books and films released seemingly weekly that revel in black misery. A lot of people are going to criticise you for that. One of the things that my area is in the literature, in the the arts area, and I haven't come across anything of, irony, the satire, the whole ability to, to look at yourself and, and poke at authority figures. They're just bland and they're very kind of glum. And it's because they captured, in a sense, by if you like the theatre space, which is, you know, should have been a real kind of place of sending things up. And, you know, that's just not there. And, and the music is similar. The idea that teachers need lessons in unconscious bias training or that black students need sessions on how Egypt was a black kingdom are nothing but big diversions. Tell it like you see it, Tony. Some people will criticise you openly. Other people will be punching the air silently, glad that you're saying Well, the, the thing is, the reality is all based on evidence. And that mistake was because we worked it happily and we tried everything to get that whole set of young black men to a point where, or I mean, black boys really, to a point of achievement. All those interventions didn't work. What did work, to be honest, was when we fired the, the very poor head teachers. And we, we brought in people with high aspirations. We brought in people with great visions like Sir Michael Wiltshire. That instigated the whole academy movement. And the results, you know, actually went from being one of the, one of the worst education districts in, in, in the country to be one of the best. So it's quite clear to me that a lot of the identity stuff was a diversion. Yeah, for sure. You have been really critical of the whole sort of diversity, um, inclusivity agenda. Is there nothing positive in the sort of new attempt that there's been in recent years to promote equality and diversity? Or do you see most of it as counterproductive, Tony? 
I think a lot of that diversity inclusion stuff, there's a lot of it that's very useful and very and, 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 and needed. For example, challenges in terms of employment, the employment space, and people thinking about who is in the workplace and the reality of discrimination that it's happening. We can see in the police, we can see in different areas. I'd be a fool to turn around and say to you today that racism does not exist in Britain and that we need to challenge the structures there to change it. What I'm saying in the book, though, is that what we haven't done is unleash the power of that community, of those people themselves. One of the things in education that we didn't do enough of was we didn't teach the children how to use their own agency, how to almost manage their own teachers, how to actually manage themselves. And in a sense, you see now we've got big mental health problems with young people because we haven't given them the resilience. Instead, what we've done, we saw differences in outcomes. We went and signed up on, with unconscious bias training for alleged white racist teachers. That took us just a completely wrong route. We were blaming the victim. That was where I'm talking about how we got unstuck. You sit as a Tory peer, Tony. How do you think your party has managed these inclusivity issues? In general, do you think the government could have done more in this area? Because it is an area now of some public concern. Of course, every government will have this problem. And I do think that this government needs to to do more. I think it's trying. I do think it still needs to work on these issues. You know, I look across now and I see a government that has somebody from a Hindu, Hindu, Hindu Indian background, and the country is pretty indifferent to that. And I think that shows how much we've progressed. I mean, if you and I were to say today that, that if you were to look across that Tory ca- cabinet or that Tory kind of governance and say that 30 years ago it would look like that, you would say, no way. Kemi Badenoch has just brought out a new report on equality and diversity. And in introducing that report, she, like you, used strong language. No group should be worse off because of companies' diversity policies, whether they be black women or white men. Performative gestures such as compulsory pronouns and rainbow lanyards are often a sign that organisations are struggling to demonstrate how they are being inclusive. As you say, Tony, and you say with authority, given your life's experience, race relations have significantly improved in this country in recent years. But aren't they now in serious danger of being set back by this inclusivity agenda? I think what's happened is that what we didn't do, it's the case of the whole idea that maybe what we didn't do, and that's why the report, we go back to the report bit rather than my book, is that the report really did land this in in a more complex area of what we call disparity and look at the complexity of disparity. So, for example, the life of somebody who is a Pakistani background taxi driver living in Bradford is completely different than a Hindu Indian doctor living in Harrow. Yet the categories or the race categories put all brown people together and call it BAME. So what we needed to do in looking at almost social mobility, social cohesion and disparity, we needed to just go at this with race, not necessarily at the forefront. We needed to look at a whole kind of uh, system of ways in which people and the outcomes that make you different are not necessarily race-based. And then where does discrimination really operate then? You see, it probably does operate maybe in the workplace, maybe maybe names, you know, for example, CV names or things like that. Where does it really matter? And, and does it really matter then in other areas? Is there other, other factors that are driving it? So, for example, one of the things that I was really concerned about was that we were not looking at the family and looking at those kinds of issues. We were then diverting to keep looking at these identity racial things instead of really getting down to the core issues. That for me, Tony, was the real unifying factor between your report a couple of years ago uh, and your new book, and indeed the new report that Kemi Badenoch's department recently brought out, that in your conclusion, ethnic minority success is evident in many, many places, and where it isn't evident, that's more down to class than race, with family being family being a massive overall driver as well. 
But you know what? Let me just tell you this, and this is quite interesting, that it's not even left and right here because even the male know that it gets more clickbait if it runs a race story than it does another story. So everybody seems to be indulged in the race element. I find it really strange that sometimes you get somebody being interviewed, a black person being interviewed on TV or newspaper, and they have to almost say that they had some experience of overcoming a white phenomenon to get to their success. Instead of just saying it was my energy or my family or whatever, we're obsessed with this thing. And it's taking us down routes that just are not right and just are not correct. And I just think that what we've got to do is kind of almost, and that's why I like what Kenny's doing in a way, is, is, is saying that we're going to look at this in a more complex way. Yeah. I, I sense there is a change. I, I sense that people are getting exhausted with this same narrative and are prepared now to listen to something that's much more nuanced. Lord Tony Saul, author of Black Success, newly published by Forum. Thanks a lot for appearing on Planet Normal. Thank you. So there you have it, Alison. Black Success, The Surprising Truth by Lord Tony Sewell, just published by Forum. I think Tony Sewell is such a valuable voice, and I also absolutely love listening to him, Leah. We were discussing before we started recording, and Cass, our producer, said she could listen to Tony Sewell reading The Gas Bill. I mean, quite frankly, I'd be happy to have him reading me a bedtime story. A wonderful voice, a wonderful voice in in both ways. And, uh, you know, as we know from the, his previous work on that very, very important commission, but now in this excellent book, I think really just sort of saying things that need saying and very, very powerful things, you know, that there is a vested interest in not being positive about the experience of black people in Britain, what he calls race hustlers. We all know these activists, don't we, Liam, who need a narrative of racism. They need a narrative to revel, as Tony Seale said, in black misery, which is to totally misrepresent. I mean, you know, we've got Tony in the House of Lords. We've got my friend Sean Bailey from a single parent home in Paddington, also in the House of Lords. It's just so too little actually saying that despite difficulties, and yes, as he highlighted, there was clearly was, I mean, you and I will remember racism in the 70s and 80s, but the fact it's so much better and also it's a much more nuanced picture. As Tony Sewell said, to just call people BAME, what does it mean? What's How can we have an Indian cancer specialist put in the same bracket as, you know, some kind of black kid in Kennington? It just doesn't make sense. But I really, really appreciate this much more balanced and indeed positive picture that Tony Sewell is painting in his book. So do I. I think it's a real kind of nastiness among certain commentators. They absolutely don't want to recognize any progress whatsoever. No. Everything is terrible. But if you don't recognize progress, in this instance, I'm talking about the progress that the UK has undoubtedly made in race relations since the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, since our childhood, Alison. Yeah. If you don't recognize progress... How can you build on that progress? And it's such a shame when you get people like Tony Sewell, people who really know what they're talking about, coming together to form that Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, just because they didn't paint the UK in the most negative possible light that they could, just because their empirical findings were that there had been improvements, still a long way to go. Those improvements were reported as if they were the product of bad faith, with elected MPs comparing commissioners to members of the Ku Klux Klan. That's disgusting. And yet that was polite society's response to what was a very constructive and courageous report. And I'm glad that Tony Sauls followed up that report with now a book of his own. And I've read both of them, and the reports very much understandably necessarily in official language. It is reports written by committee. There were many distinguished commissioners, most of them from the black and ethnic minority community, but some of them not, who put that report together that was published in 2021. We talked to Tony Sewell when that report came out, of course, back in the spring of 2021 on Planet Normal. 
And yet in this new book, Alison, you really feel that he's found his own voice. Yeah. It's much more discursive. And it's not just that the gloves are off. It's also that you really get the measure of the man. He talks a lot about his childhood, the time he spent at church groups, in the scouts, the importance of his family, the importance of local community leaders from all racial backgrounds in making him the man that he is today, having grown up. And I absolutely remember this. I was growing up in North London at the same time, growing up at the time of those Brixton riots, which really rocked working class communities across London in the early 80s. And of course, they weren't just a London phenomenon. There were riots in Bristol, in Liverpool, of course, in parts of the Midlands. And it was a dark time for the UK. But we have made such tremendous progress since then. And it's great that people like Tony Sewell shout about it from the rooftops while never denying for one second that there's still so much more progress that needs to be made. New on to our listener emails, your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts. The citizens of Planet Normal. We've had quite a lot of feedback, Liam, about the Scottish Hate Act. Funny, though. It's quite a Planet Normal topic, isn't it, really? This is two comments under my piece I wrote on it, so they have to be read side by side, Mark and Richard. Mark says, what a pathetic place Scotland has become, a government that has overseen a deterioration in life expectancy, literacy and numeracy, supported by uneducated, embittered Neanderthals. And Richard responds, as someone who identifies as a Neanderthal, I find this comment offensive. (laughs) You're getting the hang of it, Richard. (laughs) We're all allowed to say we find everything offensive. Dee says, I have a friend brought up in East Germany during the Cold War. You just can't understand what it's like to have to constantly say nothing because anything can be used against you and your family, my friend says. Well, Scotland will find out quite soon. It's the soul-destroying silence needed in every part of one's life. And finally, you like this one, Liam. Gerald says, Rangers play Celtic at Ibrox in front of 48,000 largely Rangers fans this weekend to be followed some weeks later by the return at Parkhead in front of 60,000 largely Celtic fans. One can imagine the number of alleged hate crimes will be off the scale, (laughs) not to mention those committed in the pubs and clubs where the games will be shown. I also imagine that as the fans no longer attend the same games, the level of arrest will be minimal, as to arrest thousands of fans mouthing sectarian abuse is impractical, thus demonstrating the utter pointless nature of this silly virtue signalling law. You know, this is just about as un-Scottish as you can possibly be. (laughs) Totally un-Scottish. Crikey, the Scots give the Irish a run for their money when it comes to, you know, playfully taking the mickey out of each other. You know, it's one of the most honest, healthy things that human beings can do to one another. Playfully make fun of each other's differences in order to render those differences largely irrelevant except for purposes of comedy. That's how human beings behave in a civilised situation. They make fun of each other. They laugh at each other. They celebrate each other's differences. Scotland above so many other countries has taught that kind of attitude, that healthy attitude of playfulness to the world. What are its leaders doing? What are its political class thinking that this can possibly be a constructive use of time, energy and effort? What we're seeing across the West, Liam, is the leaders don't like the people. (laughs) That's why they've coined this term populist, which means what most people want. And what most people want is unpleasant or offensive or racist or sexist, apparently, or fascist. And yet this is what we're seeing. They're now coming up with imaginary crimes to keep everybody, subdue them, keep them in their box, keep the unpleasant, poorer, particularly white working class males, of course, of whom I'm a huge fan. You know, and all those people, as Gerald's pointed out, Rangers and Celtic are going to be playing as they have, you know, time in memoriam. And now this new hate act, which could probably criminalise almost everybody in the stadium. How bloody ridiculous is that? This is from Farmer Giles in Kent. Dear Planet Normal, more perceptive commentators on the net zero policy have remarked on the massive cost of upgrading the UK's power network to cope with the extra strains that renewables place on it. In common with many utilities, underinvestment has left the system creaking, 
even before adding fluctuating renewable output and increased demand for electric vehicles, says Farmer Giles. As a business, we're experiencing how this money is being found, which, if the same process was applied to domestic customers, would cause riots. Like everyone, we've felt the huge increases in unit rates, but additionally, we've seen a 300% rise in daily standing charges from UKPN, the monopoly responsible for infrastructure on our high-use half-hourly meters supplying our fruit cold stores. No negotiation or choice, just imposition via the power company's monthly bills. Yet again, the UK government goes to the business well to finance a problem. The recent lopsided cuts in NI to try and save their skins in the ballot box while not touching employers' NI are another example. As a UK food producer, we often wonder who the UK government thinks it is working for. Nothing gets done to reduce costs, massive taxes, dodgy trade deals and tacit acceptance of the UK retail sector, screwing producers into the ground, says Farmer Giles. Nothing is learned from recent events in the energy sector and our food self-sufficiency keeps dropping. Keep up the good work. That's a really valuable email, Liam. We yep. really like, don't we, to hear these nitty gritty stories of this is the backbone of our country. People like Farmer Giles. I wonder if you're actually called Giles Farmer, but anyway. Could be Farmer Barlymo. Could be. I read this week, Liam, that what have we got? The third most expensive electricity in the developed world. How are we supposed to become competitive? The subject for another day, but we'll come back to that. Henry says, Dear Planet Normal, you are the best beacon of sanity in the business. Please never give up the great work. Hooray. Hooray. As we know, there is quite a bit of noise about defence spending or the shortage of it in the media at the moment, but the government clearly has its fingers in its ears and its thumbs elsewhere and is singing la, 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 la and doing precisely nothing about it. If you scratch the surface in the higher echelons of the services at the moment, you will find many very senior people who are desperately worried by the lack of money available to achieve the bare minimum of operational capacity and the impact that is having on recruitment and resignations. I suspect there are plenty, perhaps some close to retirement, who would welcome the opportunity to speak to you. The issue is critical and needs a real pylon. You did a great job on the army wives' housing scandal. Keep up on that one, says Henry. They will try to impose it anyway for sure. This one is the same, only much bigger. And on the same theme, Liam, this is from Phil. Dear Alison and Liam, I follow Planet Normal for the four years it's been broadcast. You both have been very diligent in discussing some of the key issues that beset our nation. As someone now in his late 70s, two things really keep me awake at night. The first is the total insanity of everything related to climate change and net zero. I know you've begun to air that issue and I would urge you to continue. The second nighttime fear I have is that of the state of the UK's defence. Alison, I think, mentioned it in your last podcast that she'd had some recent discussions with military personnel. Having spent my whole career in defence, says Phil, both in the private sector and with NATO, I can tell you that the peers' position in the UK is now desperate, almost irretrievable. An open debate would quickly reveal that we are, for all intents and purposes, defenceless. Phil says none of the three services has any real serious capability anymore and it's getting worse. I am not sure we could defend ourselves against a second tier nation, let alone a Russia or China. Anyone who tells you otherwise, including the latest hapless defence secretary, is either lying or doesn't understand. Would UK defence, asks Phil, be a suitable subject for you to discuss? You would need to choose not a politician to be your guest. Sincerely, Phil. Well, I'm pleased to say to both Henry and Phil, and Liam will confirm this, co-pilot Pearson is mixing with the top brass, aren't I? you got yourself a little pair of army fatigues, haven't you? You're like oh, Private Benjamin. <laughs> is there any other colour apart from green, she asked me. I am so out of my depth. I've just got images of you firing your way around a sort of army assault course. <laughs> Anyway, all joshing aside from co-pilot Halligan. Over on the rope swing, co-pilot, go on. We have got some very senior hitters in defence who are going to come on and be absolutely give it both barrels against a country which has allowed its defence to just fall into horrible, grave disrepair. So we'll be maybe even do quite a significant addition on that limb. And now we have a major development because we have a new Planet Normal Bard in our midst. <laughs> but this new Planet Normal Bard 
because they've written about the NHS and because they worry they're going to need the NHS soon, they want to go by the name of Hans Dichter rather than <laughs> their real name, which we know, but we're not going to disclose. Our new bard is 74 years old. I might get better health care if you don't mention me by name, this new bard says. <laughs> He says, my wife and I listen every week to your excellent podcast, A Rare Moment of Sanity in an Increasingly Bonkers World. On with the poem. This indeed is called The Doctor Won't See You Now, with apologies to Flanders and Swan. It was on the Monday morning that I called the doctor's phone. The longest recorded message makes it clear I'm not alone. I'm 11th in the queue and they're playing Bach instead. But a whole Jakarta later, my battery's gone dead. Oh, it all makes work for support staff in the back. So it was on the Tuesday morning I tried the online app. It gives me lots of buttons that my aged fingers tap. I tell it all my symptoms, which the AI engine checks and asks me loads of questions on ethnicity and sex. <laughs> oh, it all makes work for support staff in the back. It was on the Wednesday morning I Google 111. The possible diseases don't really sound much fun. I've wasted half a morning while grappling with the tech. I'm hardly any wiser, and I'm now a nervous wreck. But oh, it all makes work for support staff in the back. It was on the Thursday morning, the surgery sent a text. They don't have spare appointments in this month or the next. If I tell them what's the matter, the doctor may decide to call me for a chat if I've not already died. <laughs> oh, it all makes work for support staff in the back. "'Twas on the Friday morning, I text the doc again. "'I tell him all my symptoms, every ache and every pain. "'I finally get an answer while the evening news is on. "'And when I try to call them, the message says they've gone. "'Oh, it all makes work for support staff in the back. "'On Saturday and Sunday, they take no calls at all. "'So twas on the Monday morning that I gave the doc a call. Ta-da! Absolutely brilliant. Whoa. New bard who shall remain nameless. That's a pretty good effort. Bob's got his work cut out. Come on, Bob. <laughs> Let's see the colour of your money. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. And of course, like all brilliant things, based absolutely true, isn't it, Liam? And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week. Obviously, leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, it's my turn. Oh, no contest. I think it has to be the new Bob, doesn't it? Whose name we're not allowed to say. Hans Dichter, whoever that is. Is that some Austrian it, painter or something? Or Bond villain or something. It must be something. Or Bond villain. Well, Bond villain, Hans Dichter. Email us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Put in the subject heading mug winner and give us your postal address. We won't tell anyone, but we will send you a rare as rocking horse poo. Planet Normal mug. If you enjoy Planet Normal, please do leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. There's some absolutely lovely things on there. It really cheers us up, doesn't it, Liam, reading your lovely comments? It certainly does. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Cass Ho, Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs>